in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. Around the same time that John D. Rockefeller seized U.S. media, he also hijacked U.S. medicine. When it was discovered that drugs could be produced from petroleum, America's top oil mogul ordered his army of propagandists to invert reality accordingly. Medicines used for thousands of years were suddenly classified as alternative, while the new, petroleum-based, highly addictive, and patentable drugs were declared the gold standard. After buying a German pharmaceutical company that manufactured chemicals of war for Adolf Hitler, Rockefeller leveraged his political influence by pressing Congress to declare natural healing modalities unscientific quackery. Rockefeller then took control of the American Medical Association and began offering massive grants to top medical schools under the mandate that only his approved curriculum be taught. Any mention of the healing powers of herbs, plants, and diet was erased from most medical textbooks. Doctors and professors who objected to Rockefeller's plan were crucified by the media, removed from the AMA, and stripped of their license to teach and practice medicine. Those who dared to speak out were arrested and jailed. When evidence began to emerge that petroleum-based medicines were causing cancer, Mr. Rockefeller founded the American Cancer Society through which he suppressed that information. John D. Rockefeller is duly credited as the founder of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, you brought up some issues that, that others are related to. That's my to trouble. <laughs> Always. <laughs> All the religious groups are against me because I'm talking about population. They want more souls. I want less on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and public debt is the greatest of the dangers to be feared. It is incumbent on every generation to pay its own debts as it goes. We must have a central bank to secure this country's finances. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their money, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless. You have people who are part of the elitist structure of this country that have dominated this country openly for 40 years. I know, but they're not, is that a conspiracy? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. If people quietly working together for evil objectives, two or more, that by definition is a conspiracy. You have by their own admission. You look at The Tragedy and Hope by Professor Carol Quigley, who's a member of this elitist group. He says, sure, we've been working this. Sure, we've been collaborating with communism. Yes, we're working for a global accommodation. Yes, we're working for world government. The only thing I object to is that we have kept it a secret. And I think we have gone so far along, we should come out and say. I bet you a dollar and a half that Bill Casey doesn't know who Professor Quigley is. I don't. He's at well, Georgetown a number of years uh, ago. He, he, wrote he died a couple of years ago, and he wrote The Tragedy and Hope. He's a very noted member of, the, of your club, Tom. Tom, you've uh, got to broaden your reading a little yes, bit. Well, I, to... What I ought to do is read more about conspiracy. In the dark halls of the Vatican, there is a man who wields more power than any other man on earth. He is known as the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, better known as the Jesuits. But he simply goes by the ominous name, the Black Pope. This shadowy figure controls an army of priests and nuns sworn to secrecy and has been behind some of the most controversial moments in history. From orchestrating wars to controlling world leaders, the Black Pope always seems to be one step ahead. But who is this mysterious man? And what does he want? P5, uh, the Bilderbergers, the CFR, the Trilaterals, they seem to all be um, different offshoots of the same general secret club. And it's just a bunch of rich people. It's all people with a billion dollars who all get together to decide how to either make more money or how to fleece the sheep, being us. You know, what war is going to happen here or there, or what's going to happen between nations or powers. You know, it's all aspects of political science, which are uh, how to get populations to do what you want to 
gain further control. To summarize, we have a British monopoly teaching American students about American history and other subjects. We have a public school system controlled by a government monopoly, which is financed and controlled by global corporate monopolies, all of which are tied to the central banking system. If we follow the money from start to finish, corporate control of the public school system was made possible in the aftermath of the Civil War, during which Congress passed the Act of 1871, providing a government for the 10-mile parcel of land between Virginia and Maryland, the Virgin Mary we now call the District of Columbia, a city-state with its own police force, mayor, and its own set of laws. Well, it just strikes me, let me give you a quick example about the, the maritime law, the law of water, the law of the sea. <clears throat> Money is water by law. So when a ship, uh, this is why all ships are female, by law, all ships, rocket ship, sailing ship, air ship, it doesn't matter. If it's a ship, it's female. Right. Because the captain always refers to his ship as she. Right. She's a good ship or she's done this. Why she? Because she delivers the product. Right. The Without vessel. she, there is no product, right? It's a vessel. It's a whole of course, it's a of course it like, is a like vessel. So is your body. It's a vessel that produces a product. Right. So when the ship pulls into harbor, uh, it stops, and where it parks is called its berth. It's birthing a ship, uh -huh. or she sits in her berth. Uh -huh. And every item on that ship, well, coming out that ship, is a money. It's money changing hands. Right. And it came in on water. So, it's called, so every piece has to have what is called a certificate of manifest, uh -huh. because she is sitting in her berth. That's why when you were born, I had a birth you had you your mother's water broke. Uh -huh. You were in, you were inside a container of water. Her water broke, and you came out, mm. and therefore you have to have a birth certificate. Wow. There and it's got to be signed by the dock because that's where the ship is sitting. The dock is where the ship sits. That is funny. So once you begin to see how the words and terms are all based on maritime admiralty, the law of water, mm -hmm. the cash flow, the liquid asset. Mm -hmm. You, why, is that just in English, the dock, the water? Yeah, yeah, of course, mean, but of course, it goes all the way back to the English or British domination of the seas. Oh. And so when the British began to dominate the seas, the Knights Templar Masonic Order of the Knights Templars, who have been in, in, in the middle of uh, Asia, mm -hmm. <clears throat> came back into Western, Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. brought all of these concepts, and it was developed into a commercial system of oh. words. Uh -huh and terms and symbols which are used in courts and government and corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know your body as a corporation? Um, no, that's a whole story. We could talk for hours <laughs> on this, but your body as a corporation. Of cells, you mean? No, no, no. It's called, and by law, your body, your physical body is a corporation. Mm -hmm. And so when you die, you're a corpse. Oh. Because, you're, because when you're living, you're a corporation. You are a business. And hanging out with that person is bad business. Right. Or who I hang out with is none of your business. Right. Because, because you, it's because your body is a business. Well, and so you say, well, you know, what you're doing with, with her or him is bad business. Right. But, of course, if you get married and she's very wealthy, you say she's of good stock. <laughs> right? Words right. and terms are based on maritime admiralty, the law of water. Mm. And so that's why when you go into a court, you have a fence and a gate. The people mm. sit out here and the judge sits inside. Mm. The gate is called a flood gate. When you go through the canal, you have a right. flood gate. Right. So when you're sitting out here, you're in the law of the land. The judge has no control or no jurisdiction over the people sitting out here. No oh. jurisdiction whatsoever. Right, because they're but outside the gate. That's outside the gate. Right, right. That's on land. Right. But when you're in the, but when you walk past that gate, now you're in hot water, <laughs> and someone's gonna have to bail you out. Bail, yeah. Okay. Bail. It's, that's so, did you write a book about all these men? No, no. I've just been studying it for 48 years. Wow. But it's fascinating because <clears throat> when you understand that there's, I mean, uh, the whole subject is so large, and it would take hours to, and I'd have to go back to square one and walk through all the words and terms that are used in law and courts mm. and in and, and commerce yeah. for you to understand how pervasive this concept of water is on the earth. Wow. The law of water, maritime admiralty, uh, 
it, it's an extraordinary story about how governments rule the world. And unless you understand this, mm. you're never going to figure out what's going on. When, when, look at it. When you walk into a courtroom and they call your name, you get up and you put your hand on the gate yeah. and you open the gate. <clears throat> the moment you put your hand on the gate, by international law, you of your own volition have opened yourself up to maritime admiralty law because you were on the law of the land. As long mm -hmm. as you don't touch that gate and go through it, they, you haven't opened the floodgate. Now, once you open the floodgate, there's a piece of wood on top of that gate, mm -hmm. and it's called the bar, and you're not licensed to pass the bar. Right. So what you've done is you've opened the floodgate, but you weren't licensed to pass the bar. So what does that so mean? So that means that you are dead. You are now dead. Because Once you touch that, you are dead. Because you're no longer in control of That's your, right. Of you your are dead. Well, you're considered to be a dead man. Because That's why the attorney has to speak for you. He has to represent why you. Why are you dead? Because, because you, you, you went into the deep water and you died. You're because, drowned. Because you <clears> weren't <throat> licensed. Because you weren't... Um, right. You were not licensed to pass the bar. And the bar represents a sandbar in the ocean. But the bar is what the attorneys are licensed to pass, but you're not. So the point being is that when you open that gate mm -hmm. of your own volition, mm -hmm. you are, are considered by law to be a dead man. Really? That's why you cannot talk to the judge, because dead people don't talk to judges. So you, you get up on your little 21-inch screen and how about America and democracy. There is no America. There is no democracy. There is only IBM and ITT and AT&T and DuPont, Dow, Union Carbide and Exxon. Those are the nations of the world today. What do you think the Russians talk about in their councils of state? Karl Marx? They get out their linear programming charts. Statistical decision theories, minimax solutions, and compute the price cost probabilities of their transactions and investments just like we do. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beale. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. It has been since man crawled out of the slime. Our children will live, Mr. Beale, to see that perfect world in which there's no war or famine, oppression or brutality. One vast and ecumenical holy land for whom all men will work to serve a common profit, in which all men will hold a share of stock. What the fuck is this piece of shit?